Greetings, you two. Recently, I reviewed a book called Cultural Illiteracy. The author put forth the idea that there is a body of knowledge that every American needs to be familiar with, literate in, to fully engage in American democracy. Now, he had some interesting ideas, but I thought that his overall concept was a little awkward. First of all, I don't believe that anyone is culturally illiterate. They're literate in some culture, it just may not be the one that the author thinks they should be literate in. I think one of the reasons I found his position odd is that he was really trying to tackle this huge mass of information as one cohesive body. Well, this past week I finished a book, Cultural Miseducation, uh, in Search of a Democratic Solution by Jane Roland Martin, which is a book in a very similar theme. In fact, she references the cultural literacy um, book that I just mentioned and doesn't really consider it all that favorably. I still think the former book I mentioned, Cultural Literacy, has some valid points and a large list of terms which I think are good reference. That's why I kept my copy around. But I think this author has a better grasp of the problem. She put forth the idea that we have cultural wealth. And this cultural wealth, she breaks down into cultural assets and cultural liabilities. Now, liability, liabilities would be, for example, um, bigotry, intolerance, misogyny, uh, torture, um, hate speech. These are things that we need to teach people about, but that we do not want to pass them down as a living legacy. We would like them to be dead relics that we refer to, not active, ongoing concerns that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And the assets are the opposite. These are things that should be passed down as living legacies. Um, and the less important aspects of a assets could be dead relics, things that, you know, could be put into a reference book and put on a shelf, things that you don't necessarily want to forget, how to make um, buggy whips, for example. You don't want to forget that completely, but it isn't something that you need to teach every 12-year-old. She also discusses the hidden lessons that are in the world around us. For example, some of them are innocent. There is a super abundance of information in the world. You cannot teach everyone everything. So just by saying we are going to teach this segment over here, but not that segment over here, just because you can't do it, that's a form of hidden lesson. You're saying that one piece of information, at least to, in your opinion, is of more importance than the other. It, but it doesn't necessarily mean that one is really better than the other. It's just you're focusing on one piece of information as opposed to the other piece of information. But some of the hidden lessons are a little more insidious. For example, if you teach about science and 90% of the people you discuss as being great researchers are white males, you are saying that women and minorities aren't contributing as much. That's a hidden lesson and a negative one, a liability. These are some really good ideas. But I think that the binary approach that she's bringing to this, assets, liabilities, living legacy, dead relics, is awkward. It's splitting everything into 50-50 segments, and in reality, everything is not black and white. Everything is in a continuum. She is also showing her own personal bias. For example, she places uh, pornography into liabilities. Now, I don't put pornography into liabilities. I don't put it into assets, either. It is neither an asset nor a liability. It is a thing. It falls into a middle category that does not exist in her educational model. It's not something I believe that minors should be exposed to, but it is something that adults can use and enjoy without harm to anyone. The fact that she considers it a liability is a hidden educational message that she is broadcasting. The irony would be sweet if it weren't so sad. So, I think she kind of loses 
um, a little credibility in my eyes because of this. Now, she comes up with some ideas here about how to solve this problem, how to achieve the democratic solution that she wants. But her solutions, I think, are extremely unrealistic. Now, she doesn't give any hard and fast numbers, but from the ideas she puts forth, I can't imagine any classroom that would teach the lessons that she wants to teach that would have a student-teacher ratio higher than 10 to 1. You just could not give the students the level of attention to detail and individual focused education that she wants them to have with more than 10 students for every teacher, which is completely unrealistic, is never going to work. Even the best schools in the world are like a 20 to 25 student ratio to teacher. You know, only very, very specialized schools have a lower number than that, and we can't do that for the vast majority of kids. Um, so she she falls down on that thing, on that in manner right there. Her solution isn't really a solution. It doesn't mean that her ideas are completely worthless. They aren't. But I think her solution is a non-starter. She also brings up the idea that it isn't just schools and the home life that teaches people, that educates them, or, from the title, miseducates them. Civic groups, jobs, the media, entertainment, all of these different things are part of the education or miseducation of our children. But she falls down on a really bad trope, and that is the idea that mass media video games, things like that, are the enemy. That because of mass media and video games, our children are being saturated with evilness and bad influences, and they are being turned into antisocial, violent individuals. If this argument were valid, at a time when there weren't mass media or video games, there would have been a peaceful utopia. I would love if someone could show me the historical records that show that there has ever been a peaceful utopia on this planet. As it happened, folks. Also, if this argument were valid, countries that don't have electricity and thus can't mass media can't have an exposure to video games. They, these things have not penetrated a culture, would also be peaceful utopias. None of those exist either. And research has recently shown that video games themselves do not adversely affect people the way that opponents of video games would desperately love them to adversely affect people. They just don't. And I firmly believe that if the mass media saturation is adversely affecting people, it's because they are susceptible to being adversely affected prior to exposure to the mass media. Now the mass media does have a very negative message because fear sells. It keeps you focused on that radio program, news program, which poses you to the advertisers, which is their goal. It bleeds, it leads. It's, a, it's been a policy of news programs for as long as there have been news programs. So there are problems with this book. It's not a very big book, but there's a lot of information here. At the best points in this book, her writing becomes the most conversational and the most easily understood, where she's discussing specific anecdotal stories about examples that she wants to use as demonstrations. When she starts talking about vague, more general theories, the writing gets denser, more obtuse, and harder to grasp. I don't I haven't read any of the other books that she's written. If they're the same, I'm probably not going to read them. Um, because her style is, is awkward. Um, it took me a lot longer to read this book than it should have. Uh, I started a new book today, and I think I got further in that book in one day than I got through this book in like three days. So it was a little frustrating. But she does have a good grasp of the problem, and she defines it well. I just don't think that she has enough gradients in there. Too much binary, too much black and white. But I think that she still has some valid points. I'm glad I read it. And I think that if you are interested in this topic, you might want to look it up and give it a read just because it's a, a good argument 
even if the solutions are not there. So if you're interested in education, um, this book may be something you want to read. I'm on a educational slant at the moment because the book I started reading today is also about education. So you'll be hearing about that in the near future. Have a good one.